For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. The desert is a unique and fascinating environment that is both great and dangerous. The characteristics of the desert make it both awe-inspiring and potentially deadly. The desert is a place of contrasts, offering incredible natural beauty and unique wildlife, as well as significant challenges and dangers. Anyone venturing into the desert should take precautions and be well prepared for the conditions they may encounter. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. The Australian outback is a vast, rugged landscape that covers much of the continent. It's an environment of extremes, with harsh weather conditions, a sparse population, and unique flora and fauna that have adapted to the challenging conditions. The outback covers around 70% of Australia's landmass and is located in the central and western parts of the country. The outback has a mostly arid or semi-arid climate with very low rainfall and high temperatures. Summers can be scorching, with temperatures often reaching over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Winters can be cold, with temperatures dropping to below freezing in some areas. The outback is characterized by sparse vegetation, with plants adapted to the arid conditions. Despite the harsh conditions, the outback is home to diverse wildlife, is a popular destination for tourists looking to experience its unique landscapes and wildlife. It is a challenging and beautiful environment that has a unique and fascinating character. It's a place of contrasts, offering incredible natural beauty as well as significant challenges and dangers. Anyone venturing into the outback should take precautions and be well prepared for the conditions they may encounter. Still, for those willing to embrace the challenges, the outback offers an unforgettable experience. For Rick Magee, his outback experience would truly be an unforgettable nightmare. Ricky McGee, at the time, a 35-year-old, had been offered work in a government department in Port Hedland, Western Australia. He accepted the job and set off on the long drive, which he had made multiple times before. Driving a 2001 Mitsubishi Challenger, he took the Buntine Highway, which for much of his journey was a desert track across the outback of the Northern Territory. Because he had a couple of days before starting his new job, he wanted to visit an old mate, so decided to take a detour and drive to Halls Creek, where his friend resided. He turned left off the Stewart Highway near Dunmara, about 300 miles south of Darwin, and hit the dirt of the Buchanan Highway heading towards Top Springs. By taking the shortcut, he was confident he'd make it to Halls Creek before dusk. The road was not much more than a goat track and had its fair share of potholes, but it saved a couple of hours not sticking to the highway. Hours later, he came across some stranded Aboriginal people. They flagged him over next to their broken-down Kingswood. Not many vehicles travel the Buntine in January because it's mostly dirt and the road can get washed out in the wet season. He knew if he drove past them, they'd be waiting in the sun for a while. He pulled up a safe distance in front of the Kingswood and indicated for one of them to come and explain what they needed. All the doors of his car were locked and the windows wound up except for the front seat passenger side. He wanted to have his bases covered if they tried anything. There would be no opportunity to punch him if he hit the gas. He also had his machete. The stranded man explained they'd run out of fuel and needed a lift to Hall's Creek. He indicated for him to get in. He gave him a cold beer and they were off. About 20 minutes in, across the top edge of the western desert, he was out of beer. The passenger cracked another one and opened it for him. That was the only time I took my eyes off my drink for the entire trip, Ricky said. After 10 minutes, he began to feel groggy. His vision had warped. It wasn't as if this was the first time he'd ever had a few cans driving through nowhere, but it had never come to this. They were only a couple of hours away from Hall's Creek. He kept driving despite the feeling, but he couldn't shake the feeling of incredible lethargy. Meanwhile, his silent passenger sat back and cracked himself another can. He didn't seem concerned at all by the reckless swerving across the road. Ricky Meggie doesn't remember anything much after that. When Ricky opened his eyes, he was sitting in the front passenger seat of his car. What was going on? The car wasn't moving. When I raised my head, I could see it was parked on the side of a dirt highway, he said. He gets out of the car to have a look around. He heard some voices that were coming from behind some bushes. As he approached, the voices dropped. Groggily, he turned to walk back to the car and got in the driver's seat. 
and was about to hit the gas when he saw a figure out of the corner of his eye. In a flash, the man jumped from the shadows and onto the footstools on the back of the car. He floors it down the dirt highway, trying to shake the figure off the rear, but he had a spider-like grip and didn't budge. Using a rock, he smashed the back window of Ricky's car vehicle to force his way in. The next thing Ricky knew they were fighting while bumping along the dirt highway at well over 60 miles per hour. Then they slammed into some bushes on the side of the road. Ricky got out gingerly and disoriented. He looks and sees the figure running off into the darkness. Hours later, Maggie is sitting on the side of the road, disoriented, trying to come to grips with what is happening. When he sees people rummaging through his car, looking for anything of value. Soon, a young Aboriginal man comes over with a bottle of booze, telling Ricky not to say anything. With nothing to lose, Ricky takes a swig and again passes out. When he regained consciousness, he was in a hole covered in black plastic with some rocks and dirt thrown on top. Something was spread over my face, sand. I wiggled my toes, no shoes. I struggled to move, felt my pockets for my lighter, nothing. Cigarettes gone, where was I? I had no clue. Something was pushing through the tarp, the sound of sniffing, dogs maybe. I wriggled and pushed myself up, forcing back the cover into daylight and heat. Now I was face to face with a pack of dingoes, ready to sit down to dinner, Ricky said. Only the attempts by four dingoes to claw him woke him up. In the middle of the desert, baking in the hot sun, confusion overtook him as he tried to understand what had happened. He was left for dead. He sat down in the shade for hours, pondering his predicament. Nobody in sight. No roads, no houses, no water, nothing. Just desert. To get more familiar with his surroundings, he climbed a tree and scanned the horizon. I was a completely different landscape from where I had been the day before, or however many days it had been since being robbed. The country was a lot more barren, leaving me with the impression I was even more isolated. I was lost, I was hungry, I was thirsty. I was still feeling the effects of whatever it was I'd been drugged with during what I assumed was the past two days. It was hot and no one besides the arseholes who'd left me there for dead had the slightest clue where to start looking for me, Ricky said. After getting his bearings from the sun, he figured due west was the best direction to find civilization. Hours into his trek, it occurred to him that he was probably walking further into the desolate interior. So he turned back east in the hope of stumbling across a road or a river leading towards a homestead. He couldn't see any roads, so he headed for a big rise on the horizon to get a better view. When he reached the rise, all he saw was scrub and bare earth. Now he was getting extremely thirsty. With no water source anywhere close, he started to contemplate the unthinkable. If you have to drink urine, I suggest you let it cool down first. It doesn't taste very nice, Ricky said. Trekking barefoot, his feet were already starting to soar and bleed. The sun started to set and now it was getting cold. There wasn't much time in the comfort zone between the two extremes. All Ricky wanted to do was keep walking, find a road, and get out of this situation. When it got too dark, he nestled next to some foliage trying to get some sleep. By midnight, it started raining. The replenishment of the water was an incredible relief. He cupped his hands and gulped down as much as he could. For the next few days, Ricky Miggy wandered through the desert, chasing potential rain clouds and drinking his urine. Still no roads in sight. He kept falling over as the weight of dehydration pulled him down. His main priority at this point was to find a water source. He staggered through some sparse scrub for a few more miles before finding the first sign of water, which was wet mud. He managed a few precious drops scraped out of the ground. Then he continued walking. He followed a trail of wet patches that soon turned into puddles and the puddles to sloshy channels eventually finding his way to the edge of a thriving river. It was an incredible feeling to see such a torrent of water carving its way through the desert. I couldn't believe my luck and wasted no time diving in to get my fill. A sea of salvation in the shape of a seasonal river flowing south. I praise the Lord or whatever caused me to cross its path, he said. One minute, Ricky was on the verge of death by dehydration. The next, he was flapping about in the current of a river. If my luck kept running like that, I'd be eating hamburgers for dinner, he thought to himself. By now, Ricky Meggy assumed all of his troubles were solved. Fresh water, a cool respite from the heat, and a chance to move long distances without wearing out his banged up feet. Unfortunately, things don't always work out so easily. He makes his way downstream, half wading, half swimming, and found this was not an easy passage. 
He had to dodge the trees and branches, debris and wired fences buried under the water and carried by the fast moving current. Then suddenly around a bend, a windmill appeared. After four or five hours of struggling against the river, Ricky decided to camp at the windmill. He swam to the edge of the winding river and crawled out of the water, brimming with confidence. The brakes were finally going my way. Someone was bound to find me, he said. After a few days and a torrential rainstorm later, Ricky builds a shelter. While the rain provided essential hydration, food was scarce with only grass as his primary source of nourishment. I'd consumed so much of the rain-saturated crap, but it did nothing to satisfy my growing hunger pains, he said, and it was cold at night. Originally, food wasn't a priority as rescue and water, but as the days dragged on, the hunger became too much to bear. It was clear no one was coming to Windmill to rescue him, and he had to find his own way out. He was able to use the boards from the windmill to make a raft. He made an SOS sign out of the windmill blades and an arrow in the direction he planned to travel. I had to take the risk. With no sign of being rescued, it was time to leave my fortress and float away, McGee said. Ricky McGee had been floating for hours when a path floated into view. He paddled over to the river edge and felt a sense of relief that there were signs of life. He decided that he had to take the chance and follow the path, even if that meant leaving the sustainability of the river. Ricky gets off the raft and takes the gamble and starts his trek to follow the path. A couple of hours into the walk, he began to contemplate going back in search of the river again when he came across the main path. The countryside still resembled the sparsely vegetated dust bowl he'd been walking through since leaving the river, but it looked more promising. He walked for a few more miles before he stumbled on a fence that seemed like a real property fence, with red gates and a big sign on it. The sensation of setting eyes on a property sign that someone else had put there was one of pure amazement. All that walking had paid off. My heartache soothed instantly, Meggie said. He'd been stuck out there for a week already. Finally, it felt like he was getting closer to being found. There were a few calves and cows wandering the land, but at that stage, Cow slaughtering remained a last resort, as it looked like too much effort, and still felt confident of being rescued. He continued down the path. Blood was pouring from his feet again. He was walking on an open sore, and dared not to take a look at them. He wrapped his feet in his shirt as extra padding, pounding the dirt with temperatures climbing to a scorching 120 degrees there was no escaping from the heat. As night fell, the chill of the darkness was freezing. He woke up and continued his trek down the road. When thirst was gripping him, Ricky got down on his knees and prayed for rain. Within 15 minutes it was pissing down, I couldn't believe it. I don't know what it feels like to win the lottery, but I imagine it doesn't get much better than taking water on the back of your parched throat in those circumstances. Especially when you know it's the only thing in the whole world that will keep you alive for another day, he said. He'd been walking down the road for more than a day without a hint of another human being. Then he came across an intersection that had two signs pointing east and west that read, Bori to the left and Wallamunga Yards to the right. Ricky was now in a dilemma. He chooses Wallamunga Yards. It was all downhill in the direction of Western Australia and figured that the word yards was a good sign that some signs of life would be around. He walked a few miles and eventually arrived, nothing but worn out cattle yards and no signs of life. So he turned around back to the intersection. Now all of his energy was spent and needed to rest. He found shade and sat down as the hunger kept gnawing at him. So he went searching. He spotted a dead tree hollow inside. Without hesitating, he stuck his hand inside, searching for any nourishment. Then he felt a pinch, something latched onto his finger. When pulled out his arm, he saw a bush centipede had bitten him. He panicked as the pain raced up his arm and started swelling. He raced to the sign at the intersection and made a run to Bori. It couldn't be that far to this place, Bori. I'd die on this road otherwise. The dingoes will eat me. I've got to find a doctor, Ricky said. He's screaming in pain running down the road. This is the first time he truly believed he was going to die from something other than exposure. The left side of his body throbbed as he ran down the path. The pain became blinding as the sun set. He didn't know what to do. Then he ran into a fence hidden by the darkness. He thought he saw car lights. He yelled, trying to chase it, believing this was his only hope. He couldn't go on anymore. He plopped down. Tears were running down his face as the venom was coursing through his body. Now the left side of his neck and face had swelled. He could feel the buildup of fluid choking him as he passes out. 
It was the raindrops that awoken him the next day. He realized his arm didn't sting and could feel his face. He was alive, but had gone completely off course and was more lost than ever. Now there was no sign of the Bori intersection or a path. With no substantial food in his stomach for the previous 10 days, the hunger pains grew worse as the pain of the centipede bite subsided. Eating grass and roots wasn't enough. He was now tired of the cold of the desert and constructed a shelter made of mud, grass, and cow manure. My cowshit mud barricade stood about 60 centimeters tall by the time I'd finished constructing it and crawled inside for a much needed sleep. The absurdity of smelling like a dirty cow's arse certainly wasn't lost on me, but I couldn't see the funny side anymore. Life had become a bad joke, frankly. I was getting eaten by mozzies and drinking muddy, shitty water to stay alive, lying in shit, rubbing it over my body. What the hell was I doing out here? Mr. Miggy said. For days, he survived in his hut, killing a couple of small lizards and consuming grass. The rest and the replenishment were much needed, and he knew he had to keep moving. After a rare good night's rest, Ricky Meggy moved on, thirst gripping him once again. He remembered once on a program on TV that a certain type of black rock meant there was water below the surface. He could see those same types of rocks and figured it was worth a shot to check out the bush survival theory for himself. He got up from his resting spot and walked a few hundred yards down to the bottom of a hill. He started digging furiously and then found muddy water. The deeper he dug, the clearer the water was. I buried my face into the pool that was filling up and tried to filter out the mud with my teeth as best I could. I couldn't help laughing at my new bush survival skills, Ricky said. With enough fluids to continue on, he wanted to find the source. He walked another half mile down when came upon a big green mound nestled in the distance. As he made his way closer, he saw that not only was it a dam, but one so full it was overflowing. Days of drinking stagnant water combined with his chopped up feet from all the walking was all the convincing he needed to settle at the dam for a few days to recuperate. This plan was especially confirmed when he realized the dam was surrounded by all types of vegetation. He could see frog holes and yabby tracks. The water in the dam felt as fresh as if God had personally filled it himself, and I splashed around, swimming from bank to bank, looking for a fill of vegetation. The healthy amount of food lining the edge of the dam meant I could just slide up while flapping in the water and take a sample, he said. In his enthusiasm, he managed to dig a hole for shelter that was comfortable enough for the first night. But the constant attack from mozzies, giant Australian mosquitoes, was constant throughout the ordeal and didn't let up at the watering hole. So he had to build a shelter if he was going to make this watering hole his home. Over the course of the next two weeks, Mr. Meggy ate nearly everything he could find. Lizards, frogs, leeches, snakes, grasshoppers, and caterpillars. Anything that slithered, crawled, scurried, or crept across the desert floor was fair game. In fact, he developed an affinity for certain kinds of frogs over others. Leeches, he said, are okay, but you must eat them quickly, otherwise they attach to the inside of your mouth. But it hadn't rained much, and the dam was drying out quickly. He kept hearing planes in the distance, and it had become too much. Combined with the strength he built up from having a constant food source, water, and rest, it gave him the will to set out on one final bid for freedom. It was hard to leave the comfort of the dam, but Ricky was confident that he'd find another watering hole. The sun was burning his face and lips. Even the tops of his hands were getting torched. But as it was looking bleak, he spots a big green mound in the distance. Meggy hurries towards the mound. At last, he made it to the mound. Ricky located a big watering hole, which had two overflow dams lapping on either side. Crawling to the edge of the first overflow, he grabbed handfuls of bopples and shoved them down his mouth. After regaining some strength with food and water, he went on to work on another shelter, but this one would be different. There was timber next to the dam, sourced from the tall trees just a stone's throw away. Rick would work on this structure for days. Ricky McGee was dealing with the disappointment of not being rescued. He felt as if he was being ignored. It has been weeks now, and he was settling into a routine of building and reinforcing his shelter. It gave him a job to do to distract him from the loneliness and dwelling on his current situation. His mind wandered constantly. The frustration of seeing planes fly over consumed him. He became disillusioned about his prospects of being rescued and had run out of ideas to make someone notice him. 
As the days went by, his energy and food sources were depleting. His bones were poking out of his skin and his eyes sank into his skull. He'd lost so much weight, his calf and thigh muscle had virtually disappeared. Then, when it couldn't get any worse, he felt an unbearable pain in his mouth from a rotten tooth. Blisters inside his gums stretched from the back of his lips to the back of his throat, making it impossible to eat anything. With starvation already hovering, he knew he'd be dead soon if he couldn't eat. The pain was so excruciating he hadn't eaten in the last few days. He knew he had no other choice but to deal with the rotten tooth. He grabbed some wire he used to screw a frogs with, stuck the wire inside his mouth, and shredded the skin inside his mouth. He popped the blisters and his mouth filled with black blood and pus. He nearly threw up. Now that the blisters were gone, he could open his rotten tooth. He put a finger inside. He felt a tooth wiggling. It was now time to deal with it. With tears in his eyes, with the same piece of wire, he hooked it under the loose part of the tooth, and he used all his remaining strength to pull on the wire. A ripping sound echoed through his enclosure as the tooth detached. My rotten tooth was undoubtedly my worst experience. It was horrifying. What I had to do to extract that thing still sickens me when I think about it, Ricky says. But he was still in pain and eating was painful. He was able to consume small bopples, but nothing of significance as it was too painful to move his jaw. He was confined for five days in his shelter dealing with the tooth. When he tried to walk, he fell over. He took a swim the dam and was able to get his bearing about himself. It had been 71 days in the desert, living in a makeshift shelter on the side of an oasis in the middle of nowhere. By late afternoon, he was preparing for his daily food collection when he heard something resembling a motor. Rushing outside his shelter, he was met by the sight of a four-wheel drive, with two young guys up front, two jackaroos, or Australian ranch hands, who had been sent out from the nearest cattle station to perform their day's labor. Their first order of business required them to head into some of the most desolate parts of the country that surrounded them. In this part of the northern outback, that meant going into some of the most isolated pockets on the continent. As they slowly worked their way across the expanse, they saw something moving off in the distance. It was something unfamiliar, something odd and foreign to the regular scenery. They drove closer to investigate. As they drew closer, their curiosity only grew as Ricky Meggy rose and fell in the distance. As they approached, the two wide-eyed jackaroos looked at each other in disbelief. The mysterious figure they had found appeared to be a walking, stumbling, living skeleton. I couldn't believe it. After all this time, I wasn't exactly sure, but I thought I'd been waiting for someone to come along for pretty close to three months. I had hardly absorbed this incredible twist in my fate before new thoughts began rushing through my racing brain. Ricky said. The jackaroos only stopped at the dam as an afterthought because they were in that corner of the station and didn't want to come back all this way in the furthest corner of the furthest paddock again for a while. Because of that decision, they found Mr. Meggie. He made the 45-minute ride to the homestead. The station nurse looked at him in horror she saw this human being, just skin and bones, just days away from death. While he wanted some meat, the nurse explained that he had to be weaned back on solid food so he had a bowl of fruit and pumpkin soup. After a good meal in his stomach, Ricky called his sister, who started crying at the sound of his voice. She didn't have the heart to tell their mother Ricky was missing. A day later, Ricky was on a plane to Darwin Hospital. During his rehab, Ricky described his insatiable hunger during his hospital stay. Later, the police interviewed Ricky about the events leading up to being left for dead in the Australian outback. The cops doubted his story, even though they found his car around where he was described. At this point, Ricky didn't care if the men that robbed him were brought to justice. The fact that I made it out alive, that was my payback to those guys, he said. To this day, many people doubt Ricky Meggie's story about how he ended up in the situation to be stranded in the Australian desert. He was fortunate to be stranded during a good wet season, as having water meant he wasn't going to die in days. For someone with virtually no bush experience, I think Ricky did remarkably well, his doctor said. Months after the ordeal, Ricky Miggy returned to the dam with a friend. As closure to the ordeal, many human beings wouldn't have survived. Ricky Miggy is a living testament to the resilience of the human spirit. He survived against all odds. I had plenty of opportunities to give up, but each time I found a way to hang on just long enough for someone to find me. What I lived through is probably more than most people will have to endure. 
but anyone can apply those same instincts I relied on to problems confronting them. As the old saying goes, whatever doesn't kill you can only make you stronger. Always remember that life is worth living and be prepared to fight for it with every ounce of your soul. You just never know what tomorrow might bring. Being stranded in the Australian outback can be a dangerous situation, but with the right knowledge and preparation, you can increase your chances of survival. Like any desert environment, it's about managing water. Try to decrease your energy output during the day to conserve your hydration. Sweating means you'll need water, so do your best to get out of the sun and limit your movements so you don't require much water intake. Look for sources of water such as creeks or pools and collect rainwater if possible. Underwater sources can be found by looking for wet spots and black rocks. The outback can be extremely hot during the day and very cold at night. Look for natural shelters such as caves or overhangs or create your own using materials like branches, leaves and bark. Also, use these elements to start a fire. Friction-based methods involve using friction to create heat that ignites tinder. One popular method is the hand drill, which involves rotating a stick against a flat piece of wood using your hands. Another method is the bow drill, which involves using a bow to rotate a stick against a flat piece of wood. If you have some type of magnifying glass, you can use the sun's rays to start a fire by focusing them onto a piece of tinder. While water is the most important resource, food is also necessary for survival. Look for edible plants and insects, or try to catch small animals like lizards or snakes. And as in all survival situations, don't panic. Important survival tips so you can get through an outdoor disaster.